Next, we have uh, Faith Adiele, and she uh, studied at Harvard University, the Iowa Writers Workshop and the Iowa Nonfiction Writing Program. She conducted field work in Southeast Asia and West Africa and served as a Buddhist nun, diversity trainer, immigrant advocate, and community educator. Oh, I like her so much. <laughs> The recipient of a UNESCO International Artist Bursary and Creative Nonfiction's Millennium Award, she is the author of two memoirs, the recent Nigerian Nordic Girl's Guide to Lady Problems and Meeting Faith and Inward Odyssey, which received the Pen Beyond Margins Award. She is also co-editor of Coming of Age Around the World, a multicultural anthology, and the writer, narrator, and subject of the PBS documentary, My Journey Home. Marie Claire's magazine named Adele as one of five women to learn from. She has taught creative nonfiction and international literature from Bali to Switzerland to Ghana. And she is currently in, uh, the associate professor in creative nonfiction and interim chair of writing and literature in, at California College of the Arts. Faith joins us to introduce the 2013 fiction writer. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> if you're gonna take photos, please take them now while I'm wearing my purple glasses, because then I'm gonna switch to my reading glasses. And <laughs> that doesn't need to be out there. <laughs> so we'll see how long I can fake it. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I had this conversation with someone yesterday. I think it was Karima. We were like, yeah, a few surprises, great and all, but there is the matter of the frock. So um, when saving the world, one must look good. So thank you very much to Sharon, uh, to my new besties, Bob and Susan, um, to all the folks associated with the Dayton Literary Peace Prize and the uh, UD English Department. It's a joy to be here and an honor to have served as judge. And everyone I've met has been asking, how did you become a judge? Which I think is a polite way of saying, who the hell are you? <laughs> and it's a little embarrassing to admit that I got it the same way that good girls got dates in the 50s, by sitting at home waiting for that special someone to call. <laughs> and what a special call it was. Before I became a writer and a professor, I was an activist who worked with underrepresented communities around the globe to share stories as acts of personal and communal resistance and to recover forgotten histories as a way to change harmful, prevailing narratives. And as the daughter of immigrants, I felt a little guilty about becoming a writer, something so frivolous. But like most Africans, I had been given a name that predicted my path, and so I chose to have faith that literature was just another avenue for saving the world. My mantra was Toni Morrison's declaration that the best art is political, and you ought to be able to make it unquestionably political and irrevocably beautiful at the same time. So then Sharon calls to say, here's an opportunity to choose a book that must be beautifully written and must advance peace. And she paired me with one of my favorite journalists, Ruben Martinez, who, like me, believes in the political potential of personal narrative, the spiritual potential of research and reportage, and in the importance of those of us who continually travel between two cultures doing the hard work of translation and of turning both a critical and a loving eye towards home. From the moment she stands next to her Algerian father prepared to defend him against armed fundamentalists with a paring knife, Karima Benoun walks a tightrope between, on one hand, the tragic consequences of Islamic fundamentalism and on the other, the West's inability to imagine Muslims as anything more than terrorists or passive victims. And our ability to imagine is critical because every great historical atro atrocity from slavery in the Americas to the great 20, 20th and 21st century genocides has involved some failure of imagination, a belief that I cannot be human if the other is. 
Benun's sol solution to this unimagining is to tell the untold, the stories that disturb both stereotypes. Based on an epic 300 interviews with women and men from France, Algeria, Niger, Pakistan, Turkey, Russia, Palestine, Israel, Egypt, Tunisia, Senegal, Afghanistan, Canada, Mali, Saudi Arabia, and Sudan. Are you tired? I'm sure she was. <laughs> the book vividly presents the experiences of diverse individuals who have been victimized by fundamentalists and or who have resisted fundamentalist oppression and or violence. Benun offers up a world those of us living inside the Western media bubble have never had the opportunity to see before, and she will share some of those stories with you tonight. Here in the U.S., we can fool ourselves into thinking that literature doesn't matter. As my Nigerian father said, don't be a writer, I've told everyone you're going to law school. <laughs> Karima would have made him proud. But in much of the world, writers and ordinary citizens can be beaten, tortured, and killed for speaking or writing peace. This book knows that, revealing in its honor and compassion for ordinary heroes and heroines in a language sculpted with great aesthetic and ethical integrity is the first step towards creating the world we need. It is my great honor to welcome Karima Benun, nonfiction winner for Your Fatwa Does Not Apply Here untold stories from the fight against Muslim fundamentalism. Thank you all so very much for this wonderful honor, for this wonderful evening, for this amazing weekend. As I said this morning, I am half North African and half American, and the American half is from the Midwest. And this week, being here with you, I have been reminded that actually North African hospitality and Midwestern hospitality have a great deal in common. And I have felt so at home here. Thank you so much. I'm also very grateful to Sharon for showing some emotion earlier in the evening because I fear I may do the same, so please bear with me. I am so grateful to receive this award um, and so grateful for the beautiful introduction. I want to thank my publisher, W.W. W. Norton, my editor, Elaine Mason, my agent, Flip Brophy, my UC Davis law dean, Kevin Johnson, and my understanding students. I would like to thank my beautiful mother who gave up vacations for years to put me through college and even came with me on my first research trip for the book when we stayed in the hotel we dubbed the worst Western. <laughs> I also send a shout out to my dear high school friend Kari for all her support during this four year odyssey and to everyone else who was on my very large team but whom I don't have time to name. I know in particular that the spirit of my grandmother Elizabeth on the American side of my family, the person who taught me to read, watches over us tonight as she was originally from Ohio. And I think this event happening here would have been deeply meaningful to her. For me, this prize is a recognition both that people of Muslim heritage have been the first victims of Islamist extremism and terror and an acknowledgement of the courage of those women and men across the Muslim majority regions of the world who, whatever Bill Maher may say or think, are in fact peacefully combating fundamentalism every day from Afghanistan to Mali. I dedicate this award, thank you. I dedicate this award in particular to the Algerians, as many as 200,000 who were killed by the fundamentalist armed groups in my father's beloved home country during what was called the dark decade of the 1990s. The courage of those who defied that terror was what made me want to write Your Fetwa Does Not Apply Here in the first place. I think of Dr. Mahfoud Benoun, my father, and I have his picture with me tonight. Um, I think of how he never allowed himself to be silenced, even while receiving death threats, including one on his kitchen table that simply said, consider yourself dead. He never did. Instead, he fought back, armed only with words. 
In 1994, a terrible year, he denounced in print, signing his name, what he called the terrorist's radical break with the true Islam as it was lived by our ancestors. Mahfoud Benoun's unwavering determination was the ink with which every single letter of my book was scrawled. I was saddened back in the 90s to see how little international support the thousands of Algerian Democrats like him who risked their lives received. And we have to change that today. So I also dedicate this award to all of those who are battling against obscurantism and terror in Muslim majority settings today, from Nigeria to Iraq. I want them to know that they are not alone and that the international community, that those of us in civil society, will come forward to nourish their struggle in every way that we can. People like those I wrote about do not get much Western media coverage. Have you heard, have you ever seen the photograph of the stalwart Iraqi human rights advocate Samira Saleh Anaimi? who was tortured for four days and then killed by ISIS in her hometown of Mosul on September 22nd after publicly excoriating their brutality. Moderates, liberals, and progressive people of Muslim heritage like her face a very grave crisis indeed today, both in terms of jihadist violence and the Islamist ideology that promotes it. While many are speaking out, we need many more to do so, and I appeal for that this evening. But we also need for people in the West to hear those who are doing just that. We do not need either stereotypical generalizations or minimizing responses to fundamentalism, however well-intentioned. What I believe we in fact need is a principled anti-racist critique of Muslim fundamentalism that pulls no punches, but that also clearly distinguishes between Islam, which is a diverse and rich religious tradition, and Islamism, which is an extremist right-wing political ideology that seeks to manipulate and use that great religious tradition for its own purposes. These are not at all the same thing. The people whose stories I told exemplify all of this. I think tonight of Raif Badawi, who faces a thousand lashes and 10 years in jail in Saudi Arabia for nothing more than running the Saudi Arabian liberals' website. Despite what he had suffered, he wrote, we want life for those who call for our deaths. I think of Yanar Mohammed, the founder of the Organization of Women's Freedom in Iraq, an outspoken critic both of the 2003 US invasion and of jihadism. Her group today publicly denounces the so-called Islamic State's crimes against women and also on the ground runs a shelter for women fleeing that violence and even a helpline. I think of my friend Sharifa Kadar, whose brother and sister were killed in their family home in Algeria by the armed Islamic group in 1996, and who in response started an organization called Jaza Eruna, Our Algeria, to support other victims of terror. Sharifa sent me a few lines to read here tonight. She wrote, after all that we have lived, I say to myself that this prize is a wonderful endorsement of our work against fundamentalism, which is the ideology that nourishes this terrorism, an ideology too often ignored by the international community, even when it claims to fight against terrorism. I ask myself time and again, why are outspoken people like this not more well known? As I said this morning, why is it that everyone knows who Osama bin Laden was, but so few people know of all of those, like Sharifa, standing up to the bin Ladens of their context? We have to change that. The stories, thank you. The stories that I was privileged to tell will always be with me, and none more so than that of Amel Zanun Zawani, because she was a law student and I am a law professor. ML refused in the 1990s to give up her legal education, despite the fact that the armed Islamic group threatened to kill everyone who continued their studies. And on January 26, 1997, she boarded the bus to go home and visit her parents for a Ramadan evening and would never finish law school. 
she was taken off the bus and killed at a checkpoint. And the men from the armed Islamic group who killed her told all the others on the bus, if you go to the university, the day will come when we will kill all of you, just like this. Now, Emel Zanun Zawani died at exactly 5.17 PM, which we know because when she fell in the street, her watch broke. And her mother showed me that watch with its second hand still aimed optimistically upward toward a 518 that would never come for her. But somehow, Emil had kept hope in the face of all of that terror. Shortly before her death, she told her mother, nothing will happen to us, inshallah, God willing. But if something happens to us, you and dad, you must know that we are dead for knowledge, and you must keep your heads held high. Today, 517 is continuing to come to too many ML Zanuns in places like northern Nigeria, where armed extremists still target students. And so I tell these stories both to honor the courage of those who have fallen, but also uh, to make a plea that we will help all of those continuing to fight on the same front. Given the mission of the Dayton Literary Peace Prize to promote the use of the written word in the service of peace, no award could mean more to me. And the greatest part of winning was to be able to share this win with the families in the book. This recognition belongs to them. It was especially poignant with the Algerians because the day the award was announced was the same day as the horrific news of the decapitation of the French rock climber Hervé Gourdel by an ISIS allied group in Algeria. This atrocity revived nightmares from the 1990s when such beheadings were common. That day, activists realized that their fight was entering a new chapter. So the idea that on the other side of the world, people were embracing their stories in the way that you have done meant so much to them. Anissa Zouani, the sister of Amel Zanoun, wrote back to me the same night from Algiers to say, we do not have the right to give up because the terrorists continue to assassinate, decapitate, and threaten. We must fight to build a better world based on liberty, modernity, democracy, the respect for human life, and justice. A young Tunisian lawyer who helped me with my research wrote back that evening as well to say, I have tears in my eyes. I am so happy and proud. Justice is rendered to those who have died and whose deaths were kept in the shadow. We must not despair. We must continue now more than ever. There is an alternative. There is hope. And this prize is the proof. I am filled with gratitude to the organizers of the Dayton Literary Peace Prize, to Sharon Robb in particular, and to the wonderful judges for offering this ray of hope in dark times. We must do all we can to share these stories, and I hope that you will help me to do that. The prize has already helped so much. Finally, I should say that in my travels, I have met so many journalists, poets, playwrights, and other kinds of writers who risk or have risked in the past their lives every single time they publish. I know how privileged I am to be able to put pen to paper freely. During my research, I was given a copy of the newspapers published at Tahar Jaoud Press House in Algiers in 1996, on the day after an armed Islamic group bombing there killed 18 press workers. Somehow, the journalists, many of whom were fasting for Ramadan, and all of whom faced unrelent unrelenting danger, rallied, and that same day, they got their papers out for the next morning, working in the rubble of their offices. One of them, a woman named Rania Ukazai, po posed the following question in her article in that day's edition. Pen against Kleshnikov, is there a more unequal struggle? She answered her question with the following commitment. What is certain is that the pen will not stop. For me, winning this prize is a reminder that to defeat all forms of fundamentalism and terror, we must all honor Rania's pledge. The pen must not stop. Thank you.
So she's the one who was afraid of crying, and look at me. <laughs> it really is so, it warms my heart so much, um, deeply, uh, just the, to, to be present here. Um, it, sometimes when you go through life and, and you uh, do, do the kind of work that it takes to delve into that, it's, it's so, it is amazing to me that, um, to take that on, to take that as, as a task that, uh, and then because communicating it, telling the story, to be a, a storyteller, that's really all that I, I am, I'm just a storyteller, um, to communicate that so that someone might have it here and think to themselves, we are but tiny human beings on the face of the planet in a universe that's infinitely large and violence against anyone anywhere is wrong and just look at each other. Just look each other in the eyes and see that we are all human beings.